Why don't you turn around or turn to your side and greet somebody around you?
worship together. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. And worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
love coming to worship. I love uh, singing the songs. I love being reminded of who God is and how good God is and how good he's been to us and to me personally. And it seems as if during worship I kind of raise my eyes, my focus, which in turn kind of raises my aspirations for who I can be and how I can live my life. And we sing words like, I will not be shaken. And I really aspire to that. I really aspire to be just solid, you know, just full of faith and hope every day. And then Monday comes. <laughs> you know? One of the most powerful things that we can do during worship is, yes, acknowledge who God is and aspire to be more like Christ, but also to realize that we can't do it on our own. And so we we state our aspirations and then we say, Lord, please help me. Help me not be shaken. Remember the guy in scripture is like, I believe, Lord, now help me in my unbelief. Sometimes we're a little like that. We want to be this person, this person full of faith and hope and joy and peace. And, and yet we have to acknowledge that we can't be that person on our own. We need to interact with Almighty God who can send his Holy Spirit to us, to empower us, to change us, to fill us, to heal us. And so one of the things that happens during worship was we not only acknowledge God's greatness, we acknowledge our own frailty and, frankly, weakness in some areas. So today I want to pray for you. Maybe you're here and I use the word, a phrase, I don't even know if it's a word, discombobulated. Maybe you're here and you're discombobulated this week, you know? Maybe life's just, there's some dissonance and you may not even know what it is or... Or maybe you're here and you're in pain and you know exactly what it is and you've experienced loss or you've had a terrible diagnosis or something. Well, today I want us to do more than acknowledge who God is. I want us to acknowledge um, that we need God, <laughs> that we need his action in our lives, that we need his healing, his, his power, the peace that comes from knowing him so that we will not be shaken, that Unlike Peter, we won't look at the wind and the waves. We will look at him, and we will be okay no matter the circumstances. So today, I'm just going to say a prayer. And, and if you're here today and you're discombobulated or worse, I'd like you to just raise your hand. There's nothing magical about it. Just saying, God, I'm one of them. I'm, I'm one of those. And I'm going to pray for you. Let's just do that. Lord God, today, I just pray for every person who's got their, their hand up in this room. There are people in this room, life's just a little hard. Or maybe it's not turned out the way they'd hoped. Or maybe there's some confusion or some, some unknown they're facing. Or maybe it's much, much worse than that. Maybe the circumstances are just dire. And yet, Lord God, we learn in Scripture that you love us. And that your love for us, your acceptance for us, your availability to us, the offer of hope and healing and redemption are not in any way dependent upon our circumstances. They are simply because you are God, you are the king, and you came and you paid the price that is required by your divine justice system that we might be reconciled to you, and there is nothing. There is no circumstance, there is no sickness, no illness that can separate us from you. Even death itself cannot separate us from you. And so today we come, we acknowledge who you are, and yes, we acknowledge the truth about our own frailty and our own weakness and our own failures, and yes, we want to believe. Now help us believe, help us accept, help us find the healing, the wholeness, the strength that we need to become more like you. Lord, we pray for our friends in Hawaii, some who used to attend this church and have retired there, and so much is shaking right now. So much is uncertain, so much loss, so much, so much uncertainty. We ask that you'd wrap your arms around them. They would know their brothers and sisters here are praying for them, Lord God, and that you are still with them. Lord, I pray finally that as we leave this place, we will not just feel good for having gone to church, but we will feel embraced by you not a religious system, not a bunch of theories or principles, but you, almighty God, that we would feel your embrace, that we would sense that you know us personally by name even better than we know ourselves and you love us. Lord, today it is in your name. It is in that relationship with you that we have hope, we have purpose, we have meaning and healing and peace and love and joy. And so today, please accept our worship. 
do a work in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing one more song together.
Lord, we, uh, we just declare that you are the king above all kings, that your kingdom pushes back against the darkness. And Lord, no matter what we are going through and what we might be in the middle of, we can come and we can be confident that you are in control. Lord, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, why don't you uh, tell somebody hi and introduce yourself maybe to somebody new before you take a seat. All right, well, hey, uh, before we jump into today's message, a couple quick things that you need to know about. Um, one is, if you don't know sort of the history of SCG, um, part of that is the history of Seacoast. And in 1989, in September, um, Doyle and Connie and their beautiful children <laughs> helped plant a church there. And uh, what is cool is we have had that campus ever since. And during COVID, unfortunately, we had to shut it down. And, and then we began remodeling it and praying that God would provide a leader there to be the, the pastor of that church. And, and we found somebody. And uh, we're very excited because we're going to be reopening that campus in the, uh, the same weekend in September that it originally opened, which is very cool. So... If you, are a, if you are a Seal Beach native, you live down there, um, and you, like, you have a heart for Seal Beach, okay? Not just that you live there, but you really want to invest in that community. You want to be a part of that team. You need to get to know James and uh, the, the team that has already kind of developed down there. And if you're just a person who goes, well, it's really cute, and I want to have brunch down there, don't go, okay? It's a small campus. We can't have a bunch of folks that are looky-loos down there, but we can have people who are committed. Looky-loos. Yeah, that's a word, looky-loos. Uh, and uh, so make sure you meet James and, and that, that you're there, part of that campus launch, but um, only if you're fully committed and you want to be down there. The rest of us, this is where you just stay here, okay? Don't, don't do that. Um, the other thing is we, we've been talking about the preschool and the school that we have been developing, and we're getting closer and closer to be able to, to launch that. We're getting pretty close to the preschool. We're just waiting on the state to kind of approve some things, and then we have some space for our kindergarten class. So if you have a kindergartner or you know of a kindergartner and you want them to be a part of the community that we're building here. There's a couple more weeks until we begin that class and there's some spots open. And so go online and sign up or you can even find John who's going to be kind of wandering around in, in some of the classrooms over there. You might be able to find him as well. But easiest way is to sign up online and we want to get you in there to become a part of that. We've got great staff. We've got great classrooms, great curriculum. All that stuff is ready to go and you have a couple more weeks to get signed up. So today we're going to be in uh, part two of a series that we started last week. And if you weren't here, let me give you just a cliff note notes of where we went, is we started to talk about this weird human desire that we have to have a king in our life. And we looked at different stories, different movies, things like that. And, and not only do we want a king, but we also want to be a part of his kingdom. We want to be royalty in this kingdom. And, and the reason why we have this desire is because we were created to live under the rule of a king, our creator. And his kingdom is this universe, and we're supposed to be not slaves in his kingdom. He doesn't have any use for us that we can go and do things that he couldn't do himself, but so that we could be a part of his family, so that we could develop his kingdom along with him. The problem is, is that things went south very quickly because we all have what's called authority issues. Each one of us have authority issues to one degree or another where we say, you're not the boss of me. Even if you are God, I probably know better than you do. I had a friend, uh, a family friend growing up where we would, uh, we would travel with them throughout the years, and the kid was a bit younger than me. But if I, when I think of authority issues, I think of this kid. Because he had authority issues from day one. There was just something within him that whenever you told him what to do, he was going to do the opposite. Even if it was something good that he agreed with, he would just, out of honorness, he would just do the opposite thing. And so uh, growing up, my dad would roll on the ground and wrestle with all the boys, and he just would... He would, he, one time he found a pen that fell out of his pocket and just stabbed him in the back, which I wasn't that upset about. I thought, you know, he did probably deserved it, but eh, maybe inappropriate for a toddler. There was other times where we were traveling through India, and I think at this point the dad was pretty fed up with him, to be honest, because he wouldn't listen to directions. He would wander off, and he ended up on the wrong airplane in India. And his dad just went, oh, he's got to learn at some point. <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> Kid's got to learn. I'm like, really? Here? Okay. Uh, and then the best example, and this is a 100% true story, I heard it from them, is they were 
in Paris on Bastille Day. And if you don't know Bastille Day, it's kind of like their Independence Day. And the whole city comes out and they celebrate. Many people go to the Eiffel Tower and millions of people. So everybody's traveling around the city. They're trying to get on the underground and, and get to one part of the city over there. And so this family happened to be there and they decided we want to get out of the city. There's too much chaos. There's too many people. And so as they're getting into the underground and they're making their way through the crowds, eventually they arrive at the train that they're going to board, except guess who's missing? Yeah, this kid. He's about 10 at the time. So the dad hands the mom his backpack, would happen to have his passport and his wallet and everything, and says, save my seat, I'll be right back, he can't be too far behind. And it's true, he was right behind, except he was in the custody of police at this point. And they said, are you this boy's father? Yeah, well, you need to come with us, we have some questions. And they take him back and they begin questioning him. And by the way, side note, this is important to the story, is the dad, our friend, he happened to be of Middle Eastern descent with a full beard right now. And they begin questioning and asking very strange questions and ask for his ID and who he is and he just happens to not have it in that moment. And then they pull out a grenade and put it on the table and say, now how did your son happen to have this in his backpack? What? <laughs> Uh, what, what do you mean? So put this picture together. It's the busiest day of the year. They're in the underground. He's Middle Eastern and his son has a grenade in his backpack. At this point, the entire city is shutting down because they think they're having a terrorist attack. And so trains stop. Eventually, I don't know how, but he convinces them that he's not a terrorist, that this is all just a misunderstanding. They kind of figure out where he got the grenade from an antique shop. It's not actually live. And eventually they decide, you know what? The best plan of action is to get you out of our country. And so they place him on a train and they send him out of the country never to come back again. A few years down the road, this boy eventually gets uh, diagnosed with what's, with what's called ODD, Oppositional Defiant Disorder. It is something in him that says, uh-uh, I'm not going to do it. And I think all of us are on the spectrum somewhere of ODD, where there is something within us that just goes, no, I'm not going to, you're not the boss of me, you're not going to tell me what to do, it's my way. And that's what we talked about last week is all of us have this desire to rebel even against our Creator. But the problem is, is because we were created to bow down to the king, and it's a, part of our, it's a part of our soul, it's part of our DNA, it's written on our hearts, we can't help but bow down. We will bow down to something or someone. We can only trade one king for another. We can trade ourselves, and we can be the king, and we follow our desires. We can trade a government, a party, a, you name it. We will have something that is the ultimate authority of our life. The problem is, if we choose anything that is not God, it will end up failing us which is what happened to the nation of Israel. We looked at this nation that God has risen up. He has chosen them as the people in which he is going to bring his creation, his kingdom on earth back under his authority, where he can be king. And so he starts with this nation, Israel, and he says, okay, you're gonna be different than all the other nations of the world because I am going to be your king and you're gonna follow my commands. And then through, through you, the rest of the world is gonna know who I am. But very quickly, their authority issues kick in and they say, yeah, no, we don't really want you as king. We kind of want to be the kings ourselves. And so we're going to do what we want to do. And they do. And it turns out really badly. Everybody kind of follows their own desires and what they want. And it did self-destructs. And so some leaders come in and they say, okay, um, we can't really lead ourselves very well because we just kind of mess everything up. So we're going to go find a leader that can help lead us. And begins the process of a bunch of series of kings over Israel. And guess what? It doesn't turn out any better because they're just as broken as each one of us. And we see this continual downfall, this spiral that Israel finds itself in. And eventually it's on the brink of extinction. And all along the way, God comes and he gives these different promises. And he says, even in your rebellion, I still love you. And, and I'm still going to provide for you. And so he starts talking about in the future, God is going to send a king, this true king of Israel, one who will rule over and will establish this kingdom that is never ending. And it will bring peace and it will bring justice and even transform creation itself. And he would send prophets to remind them of the promise and to give them more detail about what this is going to look like. Now, what I want to do today is I want to try something a little different. I want you to imagine... And try to get in the, from the perspective of a first century Jew living in Israel. I want you to imagine all of this history is behind you. And you have this religious belief, but you're just, you're just barely holding on to it as you live in this tiny fishing village. 
Because for the last thousand years, you heard that, that Israel was this great nation chosen by God, but it's been a long time since King David. It's been a thousand years since he's reigned, and it's been a downfall ever since. In fact, you're currently being led by or ruled by Rome. And for the last 700 years, you've traded one king to another king to another king of enemies that have defeated you. And for the last 400 years, God hasn't spoken a word. Not a prophet, nobody. And so you're just sort of living life as usual. You're trying to be faithful, but you know what? You're not even sure you believe that anymore because it kind of sounds like a fairy tale if you're going to be honest. And so as you're living your life, you wake up one day and you hear a knock at your front door and you go and you answer it and it's one of your best friends. And they say, have you heard? He's here. You know, who's here? The one, the king, the true king, the Messiah. Now you're a little bit cynical. You're a little bit skeptical at this point. Ah, the Messiah. Yes, yes, yes. I remember the last Messiah that came along and said that. Um, he started to preach about he, how he was going to save Israel. And what happened to him? Oh, yeah, he's dead along with all the other wannabe Messiahs, and Rome is still in control. No, thank you. I'm not signing up to follow any Messiahs right now. No, no, but this one's different. Because this Messiah, this king, people have been claiming that he is king from day one. Like, you remember that you heard about those magi that traveled? And the reason why they came was for this kid right here. When he was a baby, they came and they found him and they gave him gifts and they bowed down as if he was king. Even King Herod himself saw him as a threat to the throne. That's why he killed all those innocent boys is because he heard that the true king had finally arrived. You know John the baptizer? Yeah, he's eccentric. I mean, he's a little bit out there sometimes, but he's a good dude and, and people trust him. And even he is saying that the king of Israel has finally arrived. That the kingdom of God is finally here. All right, well, I mean, it sounds interesting. We'll kind of see how it plays out. Why, why are you here today? Why are you telling me about this? Because you know our little synagogue down the road? He's coming today and he's going to teach there. We're all going to check it out. You want to go with us? And here was like, you know, I've got a light schedule today. I guess I'll go and I'll check it out. It could be entertaining at least. And so you head down there and you begin um, hearing this man teach. And to be honest, his, his message is pretty simple. He just keeps saying, repent for the kingdom of God is near. And that's not that exciting. I mean, even today, we can go to Beach Boulevard and we can hear somebody claiming to be a king or the Messiah and how we need to repent. This is not a new, new story. But as you hear him teach, and the authority that he teaches with, you start to take notice. And then he does something that you've never seen before. He stops teaching, and he begins healing. People with disease, severe pain, demon possession, seizures, paralyzed. Each person with a different need comes along, and he begins healing them. And although you're skeptical, you've never seen that before. There is definitely something different about this teacher there's something divine, maybe, about him. You're not going to fully buy into it yet because you've been hurt before. You've seen, you've seen things that you can't explain, and so you're going to withhold judgment. As Jesus begins to leave, you, along with the crowd, follow him because you want to see what's going to happen next. And so you go out of the temple, and, and then you, you head out of the town, and you go up to the mountainside. And as you're walking along with the rest of the crowd, you start to look around, and you start to realize what's happening. And it dawns on you. This man is about to start a revolution. One, two, three, 12 disciples surround him. Well, that's not a coincidence. He did that on purpose, because that represents the 12 tribes of Israel. And the place that we are now, the mountainside, this isn't a coincidence either because this is where all revolutions begin. This is where rebels go and they hide and they plan and they strategize and they build their ranks. And this is where they launch their attack. This man is about to launch a revolution and I'm right in the middle of it. And before you can think through the implications of what's taking place, he begins to teach again. And this time he says, if you want to be a part of the kingdom of God that has now arrived here on earth... Here's what it's going to look like. And he lays out the values and the beliefs and the lifestyle and the purpose of the kingdom of God. And he starts contrasting it with the rest of the kingdoms of the world. And he says, all the kingdoms of the world, they run the same way. They're about wealth and comfort and beauty and success and power. And they avoid weakness and sacrifice and grief. But it's because all the other kingdoms of the world are focused on the here and the now and you. But the kingdom of God is very, very different. If you want to be powerful, you must admit how weak you are. If you want to find freedom, you have to submit your life to me. 
If you want to find yourself, you must lose yourself in service to others. And as he begins to teach, you don't know this at the time, but you are hearing the most famous message in all of human history. We call the Sermon on the Mount. And there is no area of your life that he doesn't address. He starts talking about, here's what it looks like to deal with your money in the kingdom of God. Here's what it means to be a sexual ethic in the kingdom. Here's what it means to have character. Here's what it means to have faith. He even goes into detail about, here's how you should pray. He says, here's what you need to say. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's very clear what he's saying. If you want to be a part of this kingdom, you have to make this the first priority of your life. Everything will be affected by it. The kingdom of God is first priority. So he goes from talking about the kingdom of God, and as he starts to wrap up, you notice a a shift. He goes from focusing on the kingdom of God to all of a sudden he starts talking about the king of the kingdom, and he begins referring to himself as the king. And he says, if you want to be a part of this kingdom, you have to bow down and declare that I am your king. And that ultimately, it is about my authority, not yours, over your life. And if you refuse to declare that I am king, there will be a day in which I will come and I will separate those who are with me and against me. And I will judge those who are against me and I would offer eternal life and usher them into eternal life for those who are a part of my kingdom. By the end of this, you just don't even know what to think. This man is declaring that he is a king that he is the ultimate authority of not only my life, but the universe. In fact, here's how Matthew records it. He says, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority. When he finishes the sermon, he and everybody else begins to head down the mountain and Jesus and the disciples go to their next stop and you head back to your small village. And the place is buzzing, of course. I mean, everybody heard what he had to say. They saw the miracles and they're just wondering, could this be real? Is he actually, some people are convinced, yeah, I think he really is. I mean, did you see what he did? And other people are trying to figure out, how did he perform these magic tricks? There's, some, there's gotta be it's something to this. And, and everybody is trying to decide who this man is. Well, it's not long until Jesus and his disciples circle back to your village. And when they do, he does something that you could have never believed before. There's a young girl in your village, and unfortunately it happens fairly regularly, but she got sick and she died. And as her family is mourning her death and everybody in the village is shaken, Jesus arrives and he tells her to rise. And she does. Now, this is a trick you can't figure out. How is this man bringing somebody back from the dead? And this seals the deal. You just saw somebody raise somebody else from the dead. You're in. This really is the king. This guy is who he claims to be. And so you're signed up. I'm a part of King Jesus and his, I'm following. When he says go, I'm ready. And so you wait. You wait for his next move. And and it doesn't take long because you hear that Jesus is going to be going into Jerusalem soon and he's going to declare himself king. And so you and your friends head down to Jerusalem and you make it just in time to see Jesus riding in on a donkey. And you think, well, wait a minute. When kings ride into the city after a battle or, or to take over, they ride in on a war horse. But he's riding in on a donkey. That's the animal of a servant. But the imagery is clear. He's, he's, he's riding in to declare himself king. And so we begin shouting, Hosanna, save us. And the whole city is in an uproar. And they come and they find out, who is this person? Who is this guy riding in, declaring himself king? And we explain this is Jesus. He's Israel's Messiah. He is going to declare himself king over all of Israel. So we begin following him into the city. And the first place that he stops is the temple. And he walks into the temple. This is God's house. And he starts flipping over tables as if it's his house. And then he sits down and he begins to teach. And he says, this is what it means to live in the kingdom of God. And then he starts declaring himself as the king of that kingdom. And he says, one day everyone will come and bow their knee to me. He even looks at the religious leaders and he says, you are a bunch of hypocrites. This is like the do or die moment. There is no turning back. It is on like Donkey Kong. It is what Jesus has just done here as he has confronted and pushed everybody into a corner. I'll pause the story because here's what he's done. What he has said in these moments after making these kind of claims and stepping up and saying he is king, he is saying you either king me or you kill me. I leave you no other choice. 
And so he begins, if you rewind a couple of chapters, there's this climax moment that Jesus has with the disciples in which he asks them a question, who do you say that I am? And it's a big moment because Peter says, well, I think you're, you're the Messiah. You're the king. And that is a question that every person for the last 2,000 years has had to answer about Jesus, is who is this man? And, and people have answered it in different ways. Uh, if you take Buddhists and Hindus, they would say he's a holy man. He's a wise teacher, maybe even enlightened. Hindus might even consider him some type of God. Or you take Jews. They would say he was a rabbi. He was a teacher. He's probably a heretic, but he was definitely not the Messiah. Or Muslims. He's a prophet sent by God. He's a teacher who should be revered. He's even a miracle worker, but not God. The average secular American might think he's just some religious leader, a moral philosopher. They probably ignore him at this point. Even the average Christian, if you were to ask, who is Jesus? They would say, well, he's God incarnate and he is our savior. He's the one that came to forgive us of our sins. True. But if you were to pause in the moment of our story and you were to ask somebody in that crowd, who is Jesus? How do you think they would have answered that question? They would have said, Jesus is the king, or at least he thinks he is. See, we kind of miss this sometimes, is we miss this idea that Jesus came not just to save. Yeah, that's a part of it, for sure. But that's not the whole thing. Jesus came in order to establish the kingdom on earth, for, for him to establish God's rule again over all of his kingdom, all of his creation, and that he would sit on the throne of that kingdom. A couple of years ago, I invited a friend to church, and, and they came, and they were very polite. They checked it out, and and then I realized I invited them a couple more times and they kept making excuses and it became clear they didn't want to come back. And so I, we had a mutual friend and I asked the friend, I said, hey, what's the deal? I thought they had a good time. I thought they liked it. Why won't they come back? And he said, well, the truth is they said they didn't want to come back because it just feels like when they go here, all you do is tell them how they're supposed to live and they don't want to be told how to live. And I thought, okay, well, just to clarify, it's not me telling anybody how to live. I don't, I'm telling you, here's what Jesus says. I'm the messenger, so it's not really me. But like, I'm not even angry at that response. In fact, yeah, they kind of get it. <laughs> like, that is kind of what we do here, is we go, hey, here's what Jesus says, that you, what you should do with your life. And so I was actually not even upset. I went, okay, at least they're mad for the right reasons. Like they're offended over the correct things. And so I wasn't even, I wasn't going to argue with it. I just go, okay, well, I mean, we got that out of the way. And this is exactly why Jesus was killed. Is because he was threatening the thing that people hold on to the most in life, control. When he came and said, I am king and you have to submit your life fully to me, people had to either do it or they had to get rid of him. He came to establish this kingdom on earth where he reigns. And then he asks us, do you want to be a part of my kingdom or not? I think we get this a little bit confused as Christians sometimes. I had somebody uh, this week who came up to one of our staff members and said, hey, um, I'm really, really upset with you guys. I've had a really bad encounter with one of the other Seacoast leaders. I said, okay, explain what happened. And they began to explain that they were leading in a ministry and they were asked to step down. And the reason was because they were living with somebody who was not their spouse. And they thought, and I understand their logic, they thought that that was very judgmental and critical of this person and that they didn't understand if Jesus could forgive them and they have asked him to be, ask Jesus to be their savior, why we still had a problem. And I went, oh, I, you don't understand. And we said, we love you. We want you to be here. We want to help you grow. And I think part of that is we're going to help clear up a misunderstanding you have about who Jesus is. Because Jesus is our savior, but that's because he is our king. And so what you're trying to do is you're trying to say, can I please be forgiven and allowed into your kingdom, but I still want to be the king over my life. That doesn't work. When you come to Jesus as king, you say, I have been a rebel. I have been building my own kingdom. I've been living according to my own rules. And so when I come to you and I ask for your forgiveness, what I'm doing is I'm saying, I surrender my life to you. I get rid of living in my kingdom and sitting on the throne and I want to enter into your kingdom where you're king. But what we want is, we want all the benefits of the kingdom, the forgiveness, the eternal life, but we don't want Jesus as king. He says, that's not how this works. I came in order to establish a kingdom where I will be king and then the entrance into the kingdom is the sacrifice on the cross. 
I think what it looks like is, and this is the silly image that popped into my mind is, growing up, there was one family in our group of friends, and it was kind of surprising the first time I'd never met anybody who did this, where we came to the front door, and the mom, before we walked in, said, whoa, hold on, take your shoes off. I don't know if we didn't have a nice enough house where we had to take our shoes off, but we did not take our shoes off at our house. And she said, oh, hold on, take your shoes off. So every time we came over there, we realized, hey, one of the rules is you got to take your shoes off when you come into my house. Jesus kind of says the same thing. Hey, you want to come into my kingdom? You are welcome, but oh, hold on. Drop your opinions, all those beliefs, the lifestyle that you want to live. If it doesn't align with the rules of my kingdom, you got to drop it at the door. Because remember, I'm the king of this kingdom, not you. So if we get back to our story, we wake up Friday morning, we've watched Jesus teach, we've seen confrontations, we've seen people accept and reject him, and when we wake up that Friday morning, we hear the news that he has been arrested during the night, and now he stands trial in front of Pilate, so we walk down to, or we run down to see what is happening, and we get there just in time to see a giant crowd gathering, and they're yelling, crucify, crucify. Apparently, they've put Jesus on trial already, and they decided that he needs to die, and so Pilate gives the word to the soldiers to take him away. And you kind of think, wait, hold on, just a couple days ago, there's crowds of people yelling, Hosanna, and now nobody is there. Where, where's all the people that said they had Jesus back? And then you, you stop being judgmental because you realize you also are stepping back and kind of falling into the crowd. So the soldiers begin to take him away, and they mock him. They put a scarlet robe, a crown of thorns, a staff in his hand, and they shout, hey, O king of the Jews. When they're finally done beating Jesus and marching him through the streets with the cross, they reach a hill in which they hang him on it. And they put this sign above it. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And in that moment, all hope is lost. And you realize, I just followed another dead Messiah. Just like the rest of them. The hopes, the promises, the dreams all come crashing in. And so you and the rest of the crowd start to leave. You head back home and you go back to your life, this time even more defeated than you were before. But here's what nobody understood is that this is how Jesus would become king. Because remember what the issue was. The issue was is that God wanted to bring his kingdom back under his authority. And he wanted to provide a way for us to become a part of that kingdom. And so the way that he was going to do that was not by the, remember, it's an upside down kingdom. It's not through the way that the rest of the kingdoms of the world work, through military and political power and strength. No, this is very different because the issue that they had was not Rome or is not the religious leaders. The true issue was this spiritual rebellion, sin and death. And that couldn't be defeated through political or military power. It could only be done on the cross. And the kingdom that he came to establish was not drawn by uh, geographical boundaries or this historical moment. It was an everlasting kingdom, and it was a kingdom in which he ruled over people's hearts and minds. And so it would be by his love and his sacrifice that people would be drawn to him. And so this, this death, and eventually his resurrection, is the proof that the king has come and established his kingdom. And he promises one day that the kingdom that has been established and that is continuing to develop, he will come back and he will finish what he started and he will say, everyone who was with me, who has declared themselves citizens in this kingdom, who has declared I am their king, they will enter into eternal life and all of the rest will enter into destruction when the king comes home. And so here's my question. You hear all of this. What does Jesus want from us? What does he want? Because the typical answer that people have when it comes to God is, God wants me to be a good person. Oh, like knew more good than bad. So what you're saying is, the king just wants the rebels to be a little bit nicer. Is that how you reconcile a rebel with the king? No, there's nothing that you can do. You can't be a little bit better. You're still in rebellion. You still set up a kingdom in opposition to his. What can a rebel do to appease a king? It's only one thing, surrender and then pledge my allegiance to him. That's it. And that's what Jesus requires of us. He says, I want to be king of your life. That means you come to me and you surrender everything. I came across the, uh, it's called the oath of allegiance, which if you become a U.S. citizen, 
you will declare in front of people, and I've heard and, and seen a, that it's a pretty emotional uh, moment. And it's funny, when I looked it up, there was a symbol of a crown, and then had a circle around it and a cross through it. And then you have to read, and it's a long statement, but let me just give you the first, uh, first sentence or two. It says, I hereby declare on oath that I absolutely and entirely renounce and abjure all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince, potentate, state, or sovereignty of, wi- of whom or which I have heretofore been a subject or citizen. So what we, as a nation, require of people to become citizens here is we have you surrender any kind of authority that you once had, you reject all other authorities, and this is your sole authority when it comes to your citizenship. Now, how much more do you think King Jesus requires of us? He requires that and then everything else. He says, no, what I want from you is when you come to me as the king, I want you to surrender everything, your opinions, your beliefs, your hopes and your dreams, your money, your body, all of it now is surrendered to me and I become the ultimate authority of your life. I want you to pledge your life to living for me, not yourself or anybody else. That's what it means for Jesus to be king. This is also, I think, why... Christianity has been such a threat to nations throughout human history and rulers is because when people become Christ followers, it's not that they're just simply changing their religion. They're changing their allegiance. They're saying, I no longer bow down to this party or to this ruler or to this government or even to this ideology. There's only one person that I submit my life to and it's him. And that's why dictators and that's why governments have tried to stamp out Christianity because they know that it becomes the primary allegiance of people's lives. I've, learning, I've learned that declaring Jesus as king is sort of, like a, sort of like getting married. There is one day in which you stand in front of your friends and your family and you say, I am going to pledge to be loyal to this person for the rest of my life. But then you know what has to happen? Every single day you get up and you have to remind yourself of what you, what you have pledged. The same thing is true when you pledge your life to Jesus. Is there may be one day in which you stand up and you go, he is king, I surrender all, my loyalty is to him alone. And then every day you have to get up and go, okay, where's my loyalty? Who have I pledged my allegiance to? It's not me, it's not another person, it's always to Jesus. This is, by the way, why we do the Pledge of Allegiance every day in classes. It's because our heart wanders so easily. We have to remind ourselves, oh, where do my allegiances lie? Oh, that's right, because it usually turns inward. And I have to remember who I've been pledged to. Growing up, my grandfather would pray at the meals. And I remember, and this usually shocked people when they heard it for the first time. He would pray different than anyone I've ever heard before. He would begin every prayer the same way, master. And at first, even as a Christian, when you hear that, you go, uh, what? Master? I don't really like the sound of that. How about like friend, coworker? You know, like something a little bit less, oh. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure he did that for a reason. He did that, my mom said he did that her entire life. He never began a prayer otherwise. And I wish I had a chance to ask him before he passed away, but my, my guess is the reason he did that is because he had to be reminded on a daily basis who's in control, who's king in my life. And so he would begin it with master. Last week I ended with a very simple but difficult question. Is Jesus your king actually? This week I, I just want to end with a very simple exercise that you can try. And it may be something you're doing for the first time, or it may just be a way for you to be reminded, but to begin each prayer with master. I began doing that the last few weeks as I've been thinking about this series, and I've been praying through this as as I just began with this sentence, before I say anything else, because my temptation is, hey, um, God, here's my kingdom and all the things that I'm working on. Can you please help me with this? Or I can go, master, I'm here to build your kingdom. Remember, that was what the Lord's prayer was about, by the way. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Master, what do you want from me today? My life is yours, and I'll do what you want. It's all yours. I surrender. When you begin your prayer with that, and it's a scary prayer sometimes, but when you begin your prayer with that, it, it changes things. 
because you start seeing yourself not as the person who is sitting in the throne, but reminding yourself who is actually king. Let's pray. Master, we come and we bow down to you as our, as our savior, of course, but also as our ultimate authority. Lord, when we come to you and you come, you welcome us with open arms and you welcome us into your kingdom, you do so as our king. And so, Lord, we are so tempted to forget who is in control. Oftentimes we think it's ourselves and that we are going to build these little kingdoms and we're going to rule over them and, and it's just silly because we know that we're going to mess it up just like we have in the past and that's not what we were made for. We were made to be under your authority because you are the one who knows best. You love us. You are wise. You are good and you're faithful. And so, Master, we come once again today and we declare that you are our king. It's your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, will you guys stand with me? Please get signed up for some of those things that are coming up. The other thing that you need to know is Rooted is going to be launching soon. And so if you want to be a part of that, you can get signed up. If you want to be a leader, we, we need some leaders as well. Other than that, have a great week. God bless.